So if you haven't been to Smithsonian Gardens before, it is in Washington, DC. This is the main Smithsonian building here. And we have gardens surrounding all the museums. We have about 19 museums on the mall. So it's really a campus wide set of gardens. And a lot of the gardens are themed to the different buildings. At American History, I work a lot in the Victory Garden. And we grow things that are um, heritage varieties and heirloom varieties, things that have been grown since during World War II when the nation's people really needed to grow their own produce because so much was going to the war effort. We're kind of in that same situation now. I know a lot of people have been really interested in growing their own food at home. And a lot of people have been growing their own veggies. Herbs are a great companion plant to veggies in your garden. I just want to point out that a lot of my experience comes from working here in the Mid-Atlantic area. So things might change depending on where you live. And to always remind you to get advice from your neighbors, get advice from your extension service, botanic gardens around you, your local nurseries, your local garden clubs, and really look for that local advice. And also, I'm going to be talking about herbs in terms of annuals, those herbs that can be grown in one season, and perennials, those herbs that are hardy and that will return year after year. And whether something's an annual or perennial often depends on your location. So we're going to be talking about zones. We're here in the DC area in zone seven right now. It um, changes over time as climate changes. And we're using this map right now where we are in zone seven. If you go to Google USDA plant hardiness zone map, you'll be able to see for yourself. You'll be able to enter your location. It's actually interactive and find your own zone. So what do we think of when we think of herbs? We think of parsley, we think of sage, rosemary, and thyme, kind of like the song. Mm -hmm. But I won't be talking that much about parsley today because parsley for us is more of a cold season crop. It's really a fall crop that we put in. It does well over the winter, and then it's bolting by this time uh, in the spring and summer. You can plant it with your garlic bulbs in September and harvest both of them in June. If you are lucky to have a summer that's a little bit cooler, you can always go ahead and pull your parsley in April and May and then plant a new crop for the summer pull that in September and October, and then plant new plants in October. Again, that's something that we don't usually do because our summers get so hot and humid here in DC. The parsley bolts and we will either pull it or leave it, but we don't um, use it as a new summer crop. You could always save the seed too, couldn't you, Erin? You could. Mm -hmm. Parsley is a great one for saving seed. So once it's bolted, it still has that potential for you. And if you don't want to pull it, it's great to leave in the garden as well. Swaddletail caterpillars actually use this plant a lot, uh, along with fennel. Do, do you know why parsley bolts? I mean, why does it go? Because if it, it's growing, why does it have to uh, go to flower and go to seed? It, why does it? it doesn't it's, um, it's more of a biennial. It, it really mm -hmm. has kind of a season where it focuses on its leaves and then a season where it focuses on the next generation and its right. flowers. And so bolting is when it gets taller and when it flowers and goes to seed. A lot of people want to harvest herbs before they bolt because the flavor is better. Here's an example of some combinations that we've used using parsley. So when we plant this as a cool season crop in DC, we can plant it with our pansies and with other things that do well in the fall over top of bulbs. And it'll still look great in the spring. The bulbs will pop up right through it. Here's some of the herbs that we're going to be talking about today. We've got some annuals. And you'll see this again at the end. And we've also got some perennials. What's the difference between an annual and a perennial? An annual 
will be kind of a one season wonder. It does its whole thing in that one season. It starts, it grows, it bolts and goes to seed. A perennial is a plant that has a bit of, it's either a sub shrub or it's a little woody or it has a bit of a crown that can survive year to year. And it might survive three to five years, it might survive 20. Yep, and it also depends on your zone, correct? Because it does. we can grow tropicals even though it's a perennial, botanically it's a perennial. But in our area, unless we bring it in, that tropical is a goner by the end of the season when it gets cold, correct? Very true. So if you look at this list, basil, geranium, when you get down to tea hibiscus and lemongrass, those two are, are tropicals. Even basil is a tropical in some areas. Mm -hmm. But for us here in zone seven, they're definitely annuals, one season wonders. Terrific, thank you. Now our, our perennials, again, they're more cold hardy and they come back every year. You're gonna see a lot of patterns in these perennials. A lot of these come from the Mediterranean and so they like it hot and dry. They don't like the wet winters. They like good drainage. Mm -hmm. So we'll be looking at some of those things as we go along. Let's talk about basil. In these warm temps, you can get all sorts of cultivars like Mrs. Burns lemon, purple basil. There's even a holy basil that's used extensively in Southeast Asia that's used in drinks. It makes a tea. It's a little bit more bitter. But most people like to grow sweet basil in their gardens. It's a mint, so it's going to have those square stems, the opposite leaves, the tubular flowers. And here you can see both them um, sweet basil and purple basil growing together. Is there a difference in taste? I think the purple basil usually has a little bit more of a licorice-y taste. Uh, there's Thai basil as well. Okay. And what I found is it sprouts really easily. If you plant 100 basil seeds, you're probably going to get 100 basil sprouts which is really exciting. Um, but once you get that first set of true leaves, they might not do anything for you without some warmth. So if you've tried starting seeds, I do recommend getting a heat mat, and then you can go ahead and put those out after they're three inches tall after frost, or you can put it in a sunny windowsill or balcony. So these are some cuttings that I've taken here. Um, I got a farmer's market, Thai basil plant, and you can see those three little green guys in the Dixie cups mm -hmm. are cuttings from that. I like your use of egg cartons. That's great. Yeah, all, all this stuff can be done at home. It's uh, and compostable. Yes. So some of the great things you can make with basil our one pot pasta. I put some ingredients up here for that. Spinach and tomatoes and peppers and olives. Mix it up with some Parmesan cheese and olive oil. Peppers, sorry, basil is loved throughout the world just because it can be used in so many things. It's in Thai curry, it's in pho. It has this kind of um, anise or licorice flavor when you use Thai basil. And then sweet basil, which is more of a spicy scent, can be used fresh or with slices of um, fresh mozzarella and tomatoes to caprese salad. And it's great in pesto. And so here's a pesto recipe for you. What I usually do is I take out my food processor and I'll grind all these things together. My garlic, my fresh basil leaves, my olive oil, pine nuts. If I don't have them, I'll often use sunflower seed. Mm -hmm. And I'll go ahead and um, mix that up I'll put it into an ice cube tray and freeze that for later. And then when I get it out to serve, I'll go ahead and prepare it by warming that and adding Parmesan cheese before I make my sauce. Here's some spicy uh, pesto mayo that Cindy made. Mm -hmm. It's great with potato salad. Now, if you want a drink to cool off with this summer, you might be thinking of hibiscus tea. It's an herbal tea. 
Um, you can get in a lot of different stores, but you can also grow your own. And this is one of the tropicals that you can grow as an annual. It's called Sorrel in the Caribbean. It's also called Roselle. It's in the mallow family. And so you'll recognize that when it flowers, it'll look like a hibiscus. Mm -hmm. It'll look like okra and cotton and marshmallows and all those mallow pl family plants. So if you look here, look down towards the hand there, and those little pods are called calyxes. And the calyx is like the back of the flower. After the petals have fallen off, those remain. They're really kind of gummy and red and have a lot of vitamin C. And that's what's used to make the tea. It can also be candied. And when you get candied hibiscus, that's what you're eating there is the calyx, the back of the hibiscus flower. Mm -hmm. One of the things I love to grow is Anna's hyssop, and we use this quite a bit in the gardens. It's such a great pollinator plant. And it's an, neither anise nor a hyssop, it's actually an agastache. Uh, it's called agastache funiculum, which means like fennel, because it has that licorice scent to it. And the nice thing about this is you can sow it in the fall, you can start your seeds now and it'll come up next year. And it can grow quite large in just one season and then it self sows so you don't really have to worry about it again. It'll self sow in the same area, you can treat it like a perennial because of that. Sesame is one of the things I've been really excited to grow in the Victory Garden and it has a lot of um, heritage in India and in Africa. And it's also called Bene. And it has these great foxglove-like flowers. And it has these pods that are fuzzy. They kind of look like little horned kiwis. And that's where all the sesame seeds are stacked up. So at the end of the season, you gather all of your branches, as shown here. And this is in China. And you can dry the pods. You, you take the seeds out of the pods um, and go ahead and harvest those, mash them into tahini. It's pretty labor intensive to do at home, but this <laughs> is one of those plants that you can really grow for fun. It's, it's good to use the seeds to flavor things too. I know that the, it's great. A lot of my stir fries call for uh, sesame seed in it. So you don't ha even have to make sesame paste. You can just use the seeds. But we got an interesting question and I think uh, I should ask it now, ask you now, is can we grow those hibiscus that you just showed, the red sorrel? Can we grow them? We uh, can. Yeah. Yeah. So what I found is it's best to order it, you know, as seeds or as a plant. But as soon as the ground is warm, it'll start growing. So you can even start these inside. That's terrific. How about tea plants? Like so awesome. Tea plants proper, true tea. Um, is camellia. And mm -hmm. we're experimenting with that right now. A lot of camellia plants that are ornamental are cold hardy, but a lot of the camellias that tea comes from, Camellia sinensis, is a little marginal here. But we've been mm -hmm. successful in having them over winter with a milder winter. Thank you. Back to sesame here. Here's some sesame that we harvested along with some of our other produce, some peppers and onions and garlic. We just harvested garlic out of our garden the other day in the Victory Garden, and it's a great companion to grow with your herbs. Mm -hmm. Some of the perennial herbs, again, these are mostly from Mediterranean region, Southern Europe, like lean soil, sunny skies, and drier conditions. I've noticed they have some patterns. So when you look at plants and how to care for them, you're gonna to wanna to look at the leaves. A lot of plants that are in the desert or plants that are from the Mediterranean, they'll have these bluish gray, waxy, fuzzy, or narrow leaves. And that helps prevent water loss. These things don't like it wet in the winter. They don't like extreme cold. They don't even like high soil fertility. They actually like lean soils. And they might not like our humid or wet summers. So it's important to give them really good drainage, really good aeration. 
and look for cultivars that are good for your area. I found this difference in leaf type is true even of some of our native plants like Anna's hyssop. Again, these agastatues, this agastatue funiculum has broad green leaves. It's in an area that doesn't have to worry about water. It's out here on the east coast. We get 40 inches of rain a year. Whereas you look at sunset hyssop, agastache rupestris grown out west, and it has these narrow little silvery leaves. Again, it's trying to preserve water. So again, looking at some of these Mediterranean herbs, here's a photo of bison bee of common sage. Now sage is often used in the Hebres de Provence. Any French <laughs> speakers here might be able to correct me. And it's usually sage, rosemary, and thyme used along with savory, marjoram, and tarragon. And in the United States, we often like to use lavender just because we think of lavender when we think of the region of Provence and France. And that's a mixture that you can rub on the chicken. Um, you can use it for a variety of meat dishes. It's perennial. It, once it's happy, it's usually very happy. You can get it as a plant. I have not tried growing sage from seed. But be sure you're getting common sage. There are so many salvias out there. If you simply ask for salvia, you could get an ornamental plant with red flowers. You could get an annual, you could get a tropical, you could get clary sage. So be sure to ask for common sage when you're buying this plant. Here's a purple variety. And it has really rough texture. It has a very pungent smell that people think of when they think of Thanksgiving. And I and find you, that the leaf color really makes a difference too. If you grow variegated or the purple, it mm -hmm. doesn't taste quite the same as the plain green leaf. So yeah if, yeah, if you're looking for a really good one to cook with, try Baird Garden. Mm -hmm. And that has a, a wider leaf and it usually doesn't bolt or doesn't flower. And so it's really easy to harvest from year round. Mm -hmm. We're getting a lot of questions about, can we grow these things in containers? Because you yeah. know, we don't all have backyards, so. You can absolutely grow herbs in containers. They, they like a terracotta pot because of the good drainage. What you're gonna find is that you're, you're gonna get into questionable areas of hardiness. Some of these won't be as happy outside all winter. Um, common sage might do well, Whereas when you get to rosemary, that's a little iffy. Time you can put outside in containers all year. So it depends on the plant. And the soil depends on the plant as well. So if you're growing something like tea hibiscus, maybe richer soil compared to you would growing the sages in the Mediterranean, correct? Correct, yeah, think about where they come from. If, if it comes from the tropics, um, you might want a little more organic matter. Mm -hmm. And if it comes from the Mediterranean, you know, that's, that's kind of a sandy, gritty soil. Mm, that would make a big difference. How about, do you ever cut off your flowers uh, on herbs or do you leave them on? Do you cook with them? What do you do with them? That's a good question. Um, the, the flowers, let's see, you can see some here. You can see a, a bee enjoying the flowers. Mm -hmm. It's hard to predict when they're going to flower. A lot of the sages will have kind of this um, April, May, bloom time. This rosemary can bloom in the middle of winter, I found, mm -hmm. in this area. So it's really hard to expect when they'll bloom, but you can cut the stems, blooms and all, or when they're not blooming, and dry them, and then crumble them up later to use. I use the flowers in cooking, like chives, I've cut off and put in vinegar and make a beautiful purple vinegar. So oh, yeah. I, I would experiment with just about any flower for the herbs. Yes, all, all the flowers are edible and you can sprinkle them in salads. Rosemary breaks my heart every year. I, I want to keep buy those beautiful little rosemary plants that they sell in, in the grocery stores and put them on my mantle and then I want them to survive. C can you make that happen? <laughs> I have tried that too, buying buying a rosemary as a wreath or as a topiary, and and trying it inside. They really like a lot of light, mm -hmm. and they like really good air circulation. It's hard to make them happy inside. If you have 
a good south facing window, a good three season room, you're in a lot better luck. Um, I found but, if you keep the temperatures lower too, uh -huh. instead of having my living room, they survive under lights in my basement, which is cooler. I don't know if yeah, you- Yeah, yeah, because in, in the Mediterranean region, they're still used to getting a winter. It's just a bit of a milder one. Okay. So that, keeping them inside for the winter under lights, that'll help keep their roots dry. Um, if you have a, if your garden is, gets too wet in the winter, which sometimes happens. So I'll the, try it again. And if I, if I fail, I'm going to cry on your shoulder. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's another reason to cry about rosemary though. And that's, they've been messing with the nomenclature. Um, we've always known it as rosemarinus officinalis, but since last fall, it's now a salvia. So again, just like sage, it's a salvia. You do want to be specific with your specific epithets when you're looking for your plants. You can still find it sold under rosemarinus mm -hmm. officinalis for a good long while, so you should be fine. Mm -hmm. Now, it does soil, if I was going to grow the Mediterranean plants, how do I make it more Mediterranean soil? Do you have a trick for that for in containers or? Yeah, you really want to start, start lean. Um, you can get horticultural sand, you can get gravel, and you can add a bit of peat to that or a bit of okay. potting soil. You, know, you want some organic matter in there. Um, but again, it, a lean soil, not too rich. You don't want to add tons of compost or a tropical soil mix to it. Terrific, thank you. Um, a lot of times when you're planting these, even if you have regular garden soil, you can help give them the conditions they want, prevent splashback, things like that, just by putting gravel around the crown of the plant. That's a great tip. Kind of make a gravel mulch for it. So if we're thinking about a lot of these plants, again, officinalis meant medicinal, so it described it very well. Most of these culinary herbs are also medicinal, but there's a bright side to being changed to salvia. It does mean to save or heal, so it still keeps that medicinal meaning. And then the specific epithet, rosemarinus, means dew of the sea, showing that it's Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. Now this is a gorgeous wall of rosemary that we had until 2014. <laughs> it did not like our low temps. We went down to five or six degrees that year, one January, and lo I lost all of our prostrate rosemary. So it's really important to find the ones that'll work for you. ARP, ARP, uh, named for ARP Texas, is a cultivar that is very hardy, that does well for us. It's an upright rosemary. And so when you're looking for rosemaries, look for hardy ones. You can get prostrate rosemary and it might do well for you for years until you get that one really cold winter. Mm -hmm. So parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. Thyme is another really great one. It's often used in bouquet garnies as kind of a fresh bundle of herbs that you'll put into a soup as you're making it, along with parsley and bay leaf. It's really good for rock gardens, gravel paths, and slopes. It germinates in two weeks to a month. So you're gonna to wanna to start your seed indoors several weeks before planting it outdoors. But it's one of those ones that um, it does very well the first year. And again, it's perennial. It'll survive from year to year for you. And it's one that could actually work for you under lights on your kitchen counter if you like. Again, you're probably gonna to wanna to have a heat pad though. Hmm. Lavender is a plant that you might not think is a culinary herb, but you can actually get food grade lavender online. You can use it in lemon shortbread cookies, lemon chicken, lemonade. You're making me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> this is a lunchtime talk and you can, uh, Harvest that in June if you're growing it in your own garden. Or if you're growing one of the intermediate types, you can probably harvest all year. And people like to use them to scent their pillows, to hang and dry, uh, to make potpourri. It's used a lot in the perfumery business. And 
it means to wash. Mm. So lavender comes from love or to wash. And people used to use it in Europe for their linens, just to give a nice fresh scent. Again, when you're looking for species, be specific. They come in a whole broad range of sizes from wee one and dilly dilly all the way up to phenomenal, which can get huge. We found that the intermediate hybrids phenomenal and Provence have done very well for us. But most people do like growing that English lavender, lavender, lavendula and gustifolia. Now, oregano is one that is pretty easy to grow. It's great for pizzas. You can dry the leaves and then toast them in the oven to dry your own. And people will often ask, what's the difference between this and marjoram? Marjoram is related, it's, but it has a more distinct floral flavor. Mm -hmm. Now, with the oregano and the lavender, are there cultivars that you'd recommend? Because uh, there's so many cultivars in both of them. Uh, what, what would you choose yeah, that would be I, hard? I would recommend um, Provence and Phenomenal as okay. intermediate hybrids that would be good for growing of lavender. And um, Wee One and Dilly Dilly are really small ones, which is really fun. If you're looking for English lavender to grow for culinary purposes, people often grow Munstead. Mm -hmm. um, Hidcoat is another one that's fun to have in the garden, but but Munstead's kind of the go-to for culinary lavender. Excellent. As far as oregano goes, there are a lot of different kinds of oreganos. There is also an ornamental oregano that you'll see out there. The cultivar is escaping me, but it's... Oh, you got me too. It starts with an H and now I can't remember yeah. what it is. Yep, uh-huh, yeah. yeah. It, it's, uh -huh. kind of a, it's kind of like a hop-leaved, hop-flowered oregano, mm -hmm. very beautiful. And dill is one that's fun to grow. Now, um, this is one that may or may not be hardy for you. When this was grown, it was in the middle of the city, surrounded by concrete walls, and it was in a bit of a heat sink. So it came back for us. It, it was constantly kind of doing its biennial thing and um, had a really good stock plant that it was working from. It seems to enjoy a little more fertilizer than some of the Mediterranean herbs. It shouldn't be grown near fennel because it's so light. I had a friend that made pickles and she mistook the fennel for the dill and so she had fennel pickles. Right, and that basically means you're gonna be eating licorice pickles. <laughs> so, they're so like, I always have to label my photos just to make sure I'm getting the right one. But, and you don't wanna grow them together because then the flavor is gonna intermix, the genetics gonna intermix. but it, it might not come back for you. So you might want to change this, treat this as an annual. But it did for us down here for many years in this little heat sink of ours. It's another one along with fennel, along with parsley, that the swallowtail butterflies really like to lay their eggs on. You'll get lacewing larvae and ladybugs. Is there a distance that you have to grow dill and fennel apart? There are distancing guidelines that you can get online and a lot of things, there are a lot of vegetables that shouldn't be grown together and like things in the cucurbit family, melons and cucumbers and squash that can be confused if you're planning on saving your seed. Right, if it's, it's only it saving seed. Season, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't worry about it, but with dill and with fennel, you want the seed oftentimes. You can use the leaves, but then you're also going for dill seed and for fennel seed. So that can make a difference. But they won't interbreed because they're not the same genera. So you get the only difference is to plant them apart so you know which is which. There you go. Yes. Yeah. Is dill better to grow in the fall or should we plant it in the spring? What's the best time to plant the seed in our area? You could plant it in the fall, but again, since it's marginally hardy, I would plant it in the spring. Okay. 
there are a lot of herbs that we grow just for that flavor. And there are a lot of licorice flavored herbs. We were talking about fennel earlier. We'll continue to talk about that one. Now, when you're looking for true licorice, good luck growing it because it is a tropical um, plant and it's glyceriza glabra. Um, there's also anise and that's grown more in Europe. There's star anise, again, that's a tropical grown in Southeast Asia. But you're gonna get to some of the plants that you can grow to get to that anise flavor. And those are fennel, both Florence and bronze fennel, anise hyssop that we talked about before, and there's even an anise scented goldenrod mm. and sweet mace, which is a little tiny marigold that you can put in your garden. And all of those will have you know, flowers and, and little leaves that you can sprinkle into salads just to give you a little bit of that licorice kick. So Florence fennel is really a one season wonder. It's an annual for us. It's grown as an annual when it's grown agriculturally. Again, don't grow it near dill if you want to keep the, the species straight. This is a little easier to tell apart just because of its white bulb here. It's enlarged stem there at the bottom. So you can plant it outdoors two or three weeks before your last frost, and then you can harvest it later on in the summer. And this is one that is actually timely right now. You could also plant it right now for a fall crop. So go out and get your fennel. Now here's bronze fennel, which is one we like to grow. It comes back year after year for us. So it's more of a perennial. And you can use the leaves, you can use the seeds. The ladybugs love to hang out on it. And swallowtail butterflies love to lay their eggs on it. So you'll see swallowtail caterpillars in the fall which I was worried about. I thought, oh no, do I need to take them inside? But swallowtails are actually native here. They don't migrate. So you don't need to worry about the caterpillars. Just leave some fennel out for them and let them do their life cycle. Now, what I do know is this can be a real problem if you're in California. So please don't grow fennel in California. It's taken over some of the wild areas. So just like any plant, herbs can grow way yes. too aggressively in certain areas. Um, so please check to make sure that you're not introducing something that uh, is going to affect the habitats. Right, a lot of these things can reseed. If they're successful and they've been grown for thousands of years by people, and sometimes they're just a little too successful. Mm -hmm. Like the mints. <laughs> <laughs> we all know that mints are spreaders. That includes peppermint and spearmint. There's a native plant called mountain mint that you might want to look up. And we've had a lot of success with that in our gardens. There's even a peppermint scented geranium. And there are monardas. So that's wild bergamot or bee balm. And that has kind of a minty taste to the leaf. Yeah, I love these too because people always say, well, I only have shade, what can I grow in shade? So mint is one you could grow in shade. Dill is one that you can grow in part shade. Of course, they flower more if they're in full sun, but those two will take part shade for sure. Anything yeah. else, anybody else in your lineup? Right, most of, these, most of these love sun, but when you come to the mints and dill, you're in luck. And right. um, lemon balm is also in the mint family. And unlike, um, basil, it can take a little more heart shade. Mm -hmm. What if what if your mints and your bee balms start to get powdery mildew? Uh, basil too, what do you do? Is Do they need more sun? What causes the powdery mildew or the downy mildew? Because uh, there are different types of mildews that have that spotted look. Yeah, um, there's a lot of, you know, hot and dry conditions that can cause it. You need to kind of provide more aeration. Um, Okay. The best thing to do with monardas, I found, bee balms, is to get good resistant cultivars to begin with. And they're always breeding for that. If it's really bad, sometimes you need to just take it down to the very base. And um, you can try treating with fungicides. 
but uh, once you have it, it is hard to get rid of. So it's best to, to prune out, to provide good air circulation. Thank you. Here's a nice little recipe that Cindy showed us. This is my favorite for the summertime because I always have too much mint and too much zucchini, but everything tastes good in a fritter. It looks delicious. Mint and zucchini fritters. Mm -hmm. And here's that peppermint scent and geranium. It's fragrant when you touch it. It's also very soft when you touch it. So I love that. I usually use it just for the scent. Um, I don't bring it home because geraniums aren't great for cats because of the geranol but they can be used in teas and cakes, candies and jellies. Just be making sure you're using a recipe that's meant for geraniums because they don't really trade out one for one for peppermint. And that's the annual for us. And there are so many lemon flavored herbs. So we're often jealous of California because they can grow lemon trees in their backyards. But here you can grow lemon balm, lemon verbena, lemon thyme, lemon grass, and lemon basil. Lemon balm, again, it's one of those that can take part shade. It likes moist soil. It can be a lemon peel substitute, and you can put it in jams and jellies. And it's very, very aggressive. It will spread. And one of the ways you can actually harness and corral your mint family plants is to plant them all together and they'll kind of buck each other shoulder to shoulder and duke it out. Here we have it growing with thyme and lamb's ears, all part of the mint family. Looking again to a more tropical plant, this is lemon verbena. You can get quarts of this in the summer and grow it and the, the leaves are very sweet and very lemony. Beautiful fragrance. And lemon thyme. Mm. It doesn't always have the, the clear lemony margins, but I always find that helps when I'm looking for it. And lemongrass, it's one that I haven't grown, but a lot of people have been successful again, starting from a start in the spring, they can grow it for the season. They harvest the whole thing at the end. Um, you can trim throughout the season just by uh, taking blades of it. Um, but you really want to harvest the whole plant if you're going to chop it up and put it in a dish. I've had great success with growing lemongrass in our area because to, I use it as another ornamental. You can grow it in a pot. It's fine. And what I do when I want to use it, because you, you cook with the, the white part that's down at the bottom, that's uh, more tender than the rest of it. I've seen people make teas out of the top part, but I like to use the bottom for uh, a Thai dishes or whatever I'm using it for. It does not come back year after year, no matter what. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't found a way in our zone to make it come back. But a real trick is to buy the starts at Asian markets. And so you can just go get a start of lemongrass and uh, put it in water grow roots and you'll be able to have this in your yard, which is really a nice additive. It is probably my favorite of all the lemony flavors. Mine too, I love it in Thai food. So if you can get a hold of it, again, buy it at the beginning of the year, just grow it for the season and enjoy it during the summer. So these are some of the plants that we have in our victory garden, some of the plants that I've grown and that Cindy's grown. Mm -hmm. If you wanna learn more about herbs, there's a great resource in the Herb Society of America. They have local chapters. They have a Potomac chapter here in the Mid-Atlantic region. And they also worked with the US National Arboretum to create a national herb garden. That was installed in 1980. It has themed beds. So you can go around and look at plants that are good for tea, plants that are good in the kitchen, plants that were grown during colonial times, plants that were used by Native Americans, plants that are good for beverages, plants that are good for industrial plants. So they really did break it up by theme. They have publications that you can look into as well. And I was able to spend some time working there when I first started out my career. 
And this is a picture in the herb garden looking towards the Capitol Columns. If you haven't visited Washington, D.C., I highly encourage you to go there. And to come visit us. Again, we're in D.C., we're on the mall, and we are also online. We're here and ready whenever you have questions. The Kemper Center for Home Gardening is located in St. Louis, Missouri. It's associated with the Missouri Botanical Garden and they're a great resource. They have fact sheets on so many plants, including herbs. So if you ever want to know more about a plant, you can simply search for the name in their database and you'll get an entire fact sheet. Yeah, and unfortunately, you'll have to wait to come and visit us. We are, our gardens are not open yes. at this point, but we will, uh, be open and we'll we'll announce it on our website when we're actually open. But like Aaron said, we'll be glad to answer questions uh, at any time. So that'd be great. Send us on a gardens.si.edu and we'll be glad to answer your questions. Yeah, and check out some of our webinars and articles online. That's it. So that was terrific, Aaron. That was just fabulous. But we've got so many more questions and we have time to be able to answer some of them. So I'm going to look in the chat box. Uh, Sarah and Sarah have been great to put all the questions in and, and uh, kind of group them together for me. So uh, somebody asked about recipes and we'll be glad to put recipes up on our website uh, next week when we, when we post everything. Uh, and also, is the, the, are the mildews just cosmetically uh, not good, or is there another uh, uh, significant? Does it hurt the plant? Most monardas or bee balms will do fine with the mildew. Um, it doesn't hurt them too much. They're perennial, they'll, they'll just keep coming back. There are some mildews that are a problem, um, the downy mildew and specifically um, fusarium mm -hmm. wilt. There's mm -hmm. some pro are problems in basil. Uh, so once you get that, you know, it's just an annual plant, it can take it down like that. So that's really a matter of trying to find a good source and trying to ask about it, make sure you're getting clean stuff beforehand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. That, that's a really good point because for a while you could not find sweet basil because all the uh, basil being propagated had a mildew problem. So it's important. And uh, fungicides, I don't tend to use them on things that I'm eating. Have you? No. And that's the thing. So you can use, you know, fungicides if you're just gardening. But since we're talking about culinary herbs, it's better to just start out with things that are more resistant to begin with, provide good aeration, cut off the leaves that are problematic. You might have to cut back to the entire base. Yeah, but um, yeah, do everything you can that's organic. I agree. Um, and that's just for the health of us. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it, it's, it's really not going to hurt your plants if it's a perennial, if it's a bee balm. It, it just, we don't like the look of it usually. Mm -hmm. How about propagating uh, herbs? Do you have methods of uh, which grows better by seed, which grows better by vegetative propagation? What is vegetative propagation? Uh, how do you propagate your herbs? Yeah, there are many different methods of propagation. Seed would be sexual propagation and propagation by cuttings or by layering would be a asexual propagation. It would just be, you know, cutting off a piece and starting it somewhere new. So if you're going to do cuttings, you can do layering with some things like rosemary and lavender and thyme but with time, I would probably just take divisions. Mm. That's the easiest way. Even though you can have time come up from seed just fine, it's easier to just get the plant and have it going strong from the get-go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not gonna, uh, people are asking for specifics on fungicides to use. I'm, no. no, we're not gonna do that. And Aaron and I, neither of us are uh, IPM specialists. Uh, but we will pose the question to our plant health specialist, Holly Walker, and if she can give us any good answers, we'll be sure to post them on the website. Yeah, and again, most of these, um, this would only be an issue if you're growing Monarda to look great in your garden and you're growing some of the older species that, that get it easily. Um, but 
a lot of the new Monardas are much more resistant. Agreed. Uh, and, and this this um this doesn't affect a lot of the Mediterranean herbs as much, so you aren't going to have to worry about those. Excellent, excellent. Uh, so, or I know you showed the picture of the purple salvia. What was the name of the purple salvia? Do you know? There's there's some that are just called purpurescens. There's some that's called dark opal is one to look for. There are a few varieties of purple. Excellent. Uh, and, and what is the best resource, and I'm going to have you say it again, that people can look up different cultivars of different herbs. Uh, what would you recommend? Uh, where should they look? Again, I would go to the National Herb Society. But if you, if you know that by common name or Latin name, if you just want to look up basil, or if you want to look up ossinum, it's Latin name, you can do that in the Kemper Center for Home Gardening at the Missouri Botanic Gardens. So that's mobot.org, M-O-B-O-T.org. Excellent. And somebody asked here, we use all this lingo in our conversations. Uh, we said layering. Uh, time is best if you grow it or propagate it by layering. What do you mean by layering? So layering is laying a stem down into the soil and you often pin it down for a matter of weeks. You might nick it a bit and it's actually going to root. The stem will, will make root cells that will go into the soil and then you can cut that plant off take it out, you've got a new plant. Mm -hmm. And holding it down with a paper clip helps attach it to the soil or? Yeah, you can, you can use a sod pin or you can um, use sticks. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Okay, uh, there, now we all learned a, a, a new acronym or not an acronym, but a new uh, trade term that we're, we're using quite a bit when we're talking about herbs. Um, yeah. yeah, lavenders is propagated a lot by cuttings and divisions. Um, it's, it's a little hard to grow from seed just because it takes so long to get it to maturity, but mm -hmm. it'll, it'll germinate for you just fine. It'll just take a long time. Mm -hmm. So um, a few, several seasons get where you want it. So you might as well just, you know, buy it in a quart pot or a gallon and set it and forget it. Mm -hmm. Somebody's having a, a problem with having holes chewed in the basil in their pots. Uh, do you recommend, uh, I, I've had the same problem with basil and with uh, peppers, and I found it to be goldfinches. <laughs> so there wasn't anything I could do about it. Uh, do you know of a specific caterpillar that may be chewing on basil? I don't. That's really interesting about the goldfinches. Yes. So. I, I thought it was the biggest caterpillar I, I never saw. And I never saw mm -hmm. it because the birds would fly in, take a nibble, and, and leave. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. Um, the thing I would look for is, is just observe it. Just try and see what's coming. If they're little round holes, um, that would be a leaf cutter bee, but I haven't heard of them doing basil just because it's so spicy. They usually stick to things like roses. So I'm not sure. Um, people okay. do try making like a mild soap detergent if you want to try and repel things, but again, it's an annual plant. At that point, you might as well chop some up for yourself, harvest it, and make festo. Good idea. Eat it, and it tastes just as good with holes in it as without holes. Yeah, uh, that's very good. Um, other ways of propagating, we didn't really address how you do vegetative, where you cut, make a clipping like you did with the Thai basil. So how, how are you getting roots on that clipping? trial and error. <laughs> so <Okay. laughs> for me, I've, I've just found that, you know, you, you, you look at where all the leaves come out and you, you make a little bit like a, a bit of a stem, you know, one to two inches. You cut right above where the next set of leaves come out and you stick it in the soil and you pray. But <laughs> you can actually buy rooting hormone online and that can help if you're um, going to be doing a lot of the woody things um, or if you're doing quite a lot of them and it's just something to, to play around with. The easiest way to grow basil I find is, is actually by seed because it germinates really really well. You just need to make sure you have good bottom heat so getting a heating pad or just putting it out in the landscape right now. The soil's plenty warm, has been since mid-May, and growing it from seed should do just fine for you with basil. Okay. This is one I have never heard of before. 
uh, one of our uh, attendees has a problem with aphids on their chives. Have you ever had a problem with aphids on your chives? Not specifically, but um, I know some great aphid eaters and okay. those are ladybugs. So you can actually order an entire bag of ladybugs to go after those, which is great because then you aren't putting any pesticides on your food. And you can also order in lacewing larvae. And okay. if you have the ladybugs that are overwintering season after season, you might even see ladybug larvae going after aphids. And they're little and dragon-like, and they're even more voracious than the adult bugs. Good tip. And also make sure that when you uh, follow the directions completely with ladybird beetles, because uh, they're thirsty when they arrive. So I know that uh, we do re ladybird releases, ladybird beetle releases uh, um, during the year when we're open. And the big clue that has been given to me is make sure you have water available so they don't just fly away looking for water. Definitely. And keep them cool, probably refrigerated before you release them. Give them that yeah. drink and let them go. You're going to share some ladybugs with your neighbors, but it should really reduce the aphid issue. If, if it's still a big problem, you can rinse the entire plant and kind of rub it down manually with insecticidal soap um, or a mild homemade soap. But yeah, it's, it's ladybugs for me. Okay, I will go with the ladybugs. And we'll also ask Polly that question and see if she has uh, uh, another answer for us that we could share. Mm -hmm. um, what is your favorite herb? You showed so many different herbs. What is your favorite herb? Oh, that's a really hard one. Probably the one that I can't grow, lemongrass. <laughs> uh. But I, I really do love lavender. I found it works great as a landscape plant, great as a companion plant. It brings in lots of pollinators. It's beautiful and you can use it for scent and for flavor. Yes, that's, I, I do like herb, uh, lavender is an herb. You're right, is one of the best culinary herbs that there is and people just don't even think about using it. But make sure, and you did stress this, you use English lavender. Yes. The intermedias, the exmedias, oh no. Yes, Not harvest those throughout the year to, to get, you know, a, a nice little visual sachet sitting on your desktop, but for, your culinary buds that you want to be sprinkling on your lemon shortbread cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Use lang lavender and gustafolia, probably Munstead or English mm -hmm. lavender. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, there was a question on where do you order ladybugs or ladybird beetles? I will ask that to Holly unless you have a, a, a source that you order it from. Yeah, we do have some sources that are, that are commercial. Um, you can get them from out in California even. They harvest a lot there. Okay. Well, that's a good suggestion. Thank if you. If you look up like you know, biological methods of, of doing IPM mm -hmm. um, with ladybugs, then a lot of times that'll come up. Okay. That's good because uh, we don't want to promote any one company over the other, but uh, it's good that you just gave a source that people can look and, and do that. So we're getting close to the end of our program. And I didn't know if there were any more uh, questions out there in the uh, audience. If they wanted to ask it right now, please type it into the chat box and we'll be glad to answer it. Oh, here's one, overwintering rosemary and lavender. Now, overwintering outside and overwintering inside. So those are two different mm. ways to do it. So how would you overwinter uh, rosemary and lavender outside? Um, if I were to overwinter them outside, I'd need to first check that it's a cultivar that's hardy outside. English lavender is hardy for us outside. Rosemary arp is hardy for us outside. Then leave those in the garden in the ground. Again, if you're going to leave things in pots, that takes away some of the hardiness. Uh, if you bring a pot inside, you are going to want to keep it well aerated, um, cool temperatures, plenty of light. And it's, it's kind of hard for most people to get the right conditions. Mm -hmm. um, Cindy's been successful with some of hers, but. Yeah, not rosemary. <laughs> <laughs> not, not rosemary. No, so I, I like to keep them outside. <laughs> I, I'd like to stress that when we talk about these Mediterranean plants, 
liking drier conditions, we don't mean um, water it less at a time, we mean water it thoroughly and then wait until it's not as moist before watering again. Wait until it's a little bit drier to finger touch to water thoroughly again. It just needs a little more time between watering. Yes. Um, to the drain. Yeah, I've also found when I have pots, it, as long as the, the plants aren't too far away from their hardiness zones, you can cluster the pots together. Often I put pots inside of pots and then stuff the larger pot with leaves and then stick the other pot down inside. I put it in an area that's a little bit warm in the winter, but not, not, too, uh, not too much sun because then you could cause it to grow in different types of time periods during the winter. So you, you, there are tricks that you can do. And I was taught many, many years ago in horticulture uh, school that the best way to find things out is just to try to grow it yourself and find out what works for yourself. So hopefully we'll get more people to, to try things out. Um, ask, we got asked the question again, how far apart do dill and fennel have to be? And I think we should emphasize that they're not going to um, mix. They're not going to pollinate each other and create a new species because there are two different genera. But only just so that you know which is which when you're harvesting so you don't make fennel pickles, correct? Correct. Okay, this is a good one, perilla. You didn't even mention perilla. Do you eat perilla? Oh, you eat perilla? <laughs> I didn't mention perilla purposely. <laughs> okay, good, tell us why. <laughs> because, you know, like, like mint and like lemon balm, I, once you have it, you have it. And unfortunately all the um, national park area around you has it too, I found. So um, that is one that's gotten invasive forest, but it's also called um, shizo. It's, it's a very important salad herb in a lot of Asian cultures. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of spicy and peppery, um, looks a little bit like basil, but has a jagged leaf. And um, it goes to flower a lot like a basil one. Yep, that is, that is so true. You will have it everywhere if you plant it. It is delicious, um, but be very careful. If you're going to grow it, cut the seed heads off of it. And thank goodness it is an annual, but it is a very prolific annual. Yeah. Um, so that, that's the end of our program. I just want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, thank Erin for uh, enlightening us on these different herbs and with all her professionalism. And we're so glad to have each and every one of you attend our program. We will have another webinar program next Wednesday, and this one is going to be on monarchs and how you have a monarch garden and what you can do to be a monarch way station. So this program will be posted up on our website next week, and you will have the slides that uh, go along with Erin's uh, comments as, as she's talking with the slides. So thank you very much for joining us. Now go on out and everybody find their favorite herb and make their favorite dish or favorite drink with the herb that they've been growing or their neighbor's been growing if you can get them to share, but social distance. So thanks for everyone. Good afternoon. Bye.